Selling your dental practice is the second biggest decision of your dental career, and buying that practice is the first. I'm thrilled to have an expert on transitions with me here today. If you need help buying a dental practice with success and not stress, text buy to 215-543-6454. If you need help selling your dental practice, text sell to 215-543-6454. Six four five four. So I'd like Miles and guests to introduce themselves to our audience. Hey, thanks a lot, Paul. My name's Rex Plomman, a partner at DDS Match in Chicago Land in Northern Illinois. Really a franchisee here. I've been a longtime player, I guess I'll call myself, in the dental industry space. Thankful to my father for bringing me in over thirty years ago. Now I've been a partner with DDS Match for over six years in the Chicago marketplace. Prior to that, I was with a major distributor. And I'm um, all about facilitating win-win scenarios for my clients as it pertains to the transition of the ownership of their dental practice. I, I absolutely love that. I think what I'd like to kind of highlight for our audience, everyone deserves empathy. Everyone deserves compassion. And even though I grew up with my dad as a dentist and learned so much, and even though I was a dental assistant for him and answered the phones and did all the types of things, until you become a dental practice owner, you just don't know how overwhelming it is to have to deal with so many vendors every single day. You know, a, a dental office, I think, is just extraordinarily complex with the amount of things it needs to buy. And I know as a distributor or manufacturer, you probably saw that firsthand and what you did in your dad. Is that an accurate way to put it? Yeah, for sure, Paul. And, you know, if you think about it, the access into a dental business slash dental practice is so easy compared to trying to get in the doors of a Fortune 500 company to see the CEO or to, to get into a yes. hospital system to get to the administrator. Good luck, right? You know, but it's fairly easy to get to the front desk person who could be the office yes. manager who's second to the dentist practice owner, you know, dental practice owner, et cetera. So, yeah, they get a, they get pounded a little bit by the vendors out there. Yeah, I was just at my dental practice yesterday. There's just so many fun and frustrating parts. It's like an emotional roller coaster. You're never allowed to get off, Rex. That's how I describe it. So um, I love that you sure. are helping dentists live their best lives. And I think what we've been sharing in these podcasts with the DDS Match team, you guys are an awesome team, super responsible, not just part sponsors and partners with us, is really how dentists can make better decisions in this process, because dental school doesn't talk enough about the biggest decisions you will have to make in buying and selling a dental practice. Now, as someone who was a broker, Rex, I just want to take a minute and share this. So I'm a dentist and I had to jump over many hurdles to become a dentist, okay? Climb up many ladders. And then when I became a broker, I said to the person who ran the company, who's really a, a great guy and a mentor to me, I said, what do, you, what do I have to do to become a broker? He goes, nothing. You're a broker now. I go, man, that was pretty easy because in this state, you didn't have to have a real estate license. So maybe this is a good jumping off point because there's a lot of, to be as polite as possible, irresponsible things being done in the broker world with dentists. So why should a dentist or doctor consider you in DDS Match as their transition professional? Well, personally, Paul, I am a licensed business broker and I do carry a real estate license as well to support that side of the process here. But it all really goes back to my foundation and, and the goals at DDS Match coming together. And our goal at DDS Match is to bring about win-win scenarios as it relates to the goals of selling a practice for our dental practice owners. And maybe that's an asset sale, 100% asset sale. Maybe that's a partner that we need to find for them. Maybe it's an associate to ownership, but we're looking for that win-win scenario. And thankfully, my experiences prior, prior to joining DDS Match at that major distributor, I was in the role of a general manager for 20 years and there dealing with the sales professionals, the service professionals, and the practice owners, thousands of them here in the Midwest. Um, it was all about building relationships, having strong communication, having strong negotiation skills. You know, you might be using those in a reactive way or proactive way, but every day we were hit with that in that role of general manager at that distributor. And that's certainly what we need in, in fostering the goals of our clients and selling their dental practice to have strong relationships and networks out there, have strong communication, being really candid, being transparent, et cetera, in our communication skills and certainly in negotiating for our clients 
a good deal for them with the value of their practice. And so that's kind of what it's all about from my professional side. And at DDS Match, when I joined, I was so excited because it was an emerging brand that had a great value proposition. And thankfully, our founder, Thad Miller, saw that there was a need to bring processes and better value to practice owners in transitioning the ownership of their practices. And so he went about and brought in some tremendous partners with unique tools. And he implemented our trusted transition process to really formulate the right strategy from A to Z to bring about that win-win scenario in transacting that practice, whether it be over time or in one full swoop. And I'm very thankful to be with this team. Um, we've got great synergy from coast to coast with all of our DDS match partners. Many of us work together in our prior lives and we just bring some great value with everything we do uh, over at DDS match. I love that, Sharon. You know, I've been, one of my goals with these podcasts is to teach you guys how to talk to dentists on their terms. So, you know, dentists get hit up at parties for many things about their professional advice outside of professional situations. They go, you know, I'll be getting nachos. I mean, do you think I need a crown on this tooth? I go, I don't, I don't even know you, right? And I would say, it would be irresponsible of me to make a treatment recommendation if I didn't at least have an x-ray of your tooth, a photo, what was happening. And I think what you guys do amazingly well is, you know, you gather the data through your trusted transition process so you can give a responsible I want to, whether I call it a goal or plan to a dentist, because there's too much misinformation out there. Sell a practice for 70% of collections. People say a DSO will pay 20 times EBITDA and you say, what's EBITDA? And they say, I have no idea what that is, right? So I think that you guys, since you distill it down through this, your trusted transition process. And I want to highlight before we get to our next question, and it's to reinforce through all the brokers, Rex, what do you do with the valuation piece? If I came to you, I'm in Chicago, I say, I want to sell my practice, does a million dollars a year. My friend told me it's worth 1.2 million. Another friend told me it's worth 500 grand. I want you to help me, Rex. Tell us about how you guys go through that valuation process. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I think it's about the value that we bring at DDS Match and what was prescribed to bring about the best scenario possible to support our practice owners. And that one of those first steps is bringing about a third party to do those valuations of the practices. We feel that there just wasn't the right transparency in the development of the valuations of practices traditionally in dentistry before we arrived on the scene. And so to really pump up the transparency and trust in valuing practices, we've utilized this third party accounting firm that takes all the data that we gather from our practice owners and brings about a valuation that's really strong, that has a great foundation and is trustworthy because that partner that develops that valuation, that accounting firm called Blue & Company out of Indianapolis, they don't have a stake in the sale of the practice like yeah. the broker does, you know? And so I think, I think that's, that's really key piece. for dentists. Dentists, and we listen, you were a manufacturer rep and distributor rep. It's not easy to be a dentist. We get attacked from all ends with stuff being sold to us, things like that. Dentists sometimes cause those that pain themselves by not doing research right. But we are on guard against the scam factor, right? We just on guard against yes. it. So when you can say, yes. hey, these people have done this, you know, and I, I think that, you know, people say, Rex, nothing's 100% in life, but I will tell you two things that are 100%. Number one, this is 100%. If a dentist worked four days a week, and then they go down to three days a week, they never want to go back to four. I've never seen that once. If they work three and go to two, they never want to go back. And the other is, buyers yeah. always want to pay less and sellers think their practice is worth more. And now you're able to say, to both parties, which is just hugely, I'm sure, impactful on the process that we have this third party that's done this. The next thing I want to ask is, how would you describe the market today? Buyers, sellers, how would you describe the market today? Maybe some dentists are thinking about things from when they graduated. Maybe some people are hearing wild things at CE courses. Tell us, how would you describe the market? Yeah, it's definitely ever changing, but ever so slightly over time. And I would say today, Paul, we're dealing with, with a really healthy market, I think. It might have taken a little time for buyers to adjust to new interest rates that were a little higher than what we've seen in the last five, 10 years, wherever, however long those 3% rates were hanging in there. It, it takes a little bit of, of time. There's a little shock involved, right, for that buyer to get used to seeing 7% interest rates on loans. I think that's occurred. And thankfully, from the private buyer side, we're interacting with a lot of new private buyers that are still coming to the marketplace. 
looking for their, their practice to start their own footprint as a practice owner. So it's really healthy from that private buyer side. On the sell side, I, I feel like here, we're really starting to see that influx of baby boomers coming to the marketplace. Uh, maybe they've been pent up a little bit, but otherwise in many, many you know, articles we read and research we've seen, they're right on time with coming out to retire. And I'm sure it's no different in other markets, but- I, I like this, Rex. I just want to add to our discussion. You know, I was uh, did a big show about DSO or private practice. And one of my friends uh, said, you know, COVID taught him that he didn't really miss going to the office. And he said, you know, when I was home, I thought maybe I wouldn't have anything to do, but he goes, I kind of liked it. And his treatment plan for himself was to partner with the DPO and he's happy. doesn't mean everyone has to do that, but I think that what should excite potential buyers, and I agree with you, is that sellers are looking to be creative, maybe looking to do things earlier than they ever have, but you need to be paying attention so you can be successful. And the other thing I want to ask you is, this is about education. And some of it, Rex, is just basic education. So what's simple to me as a dentist may be very complex to you as a patient. So just tell our audience, I describe banks like our moms, right? But I'm actually going to change that. Banks are like our, are like our grandmoms, right? Because if you had a million dollars in debt, uh, Rex, and someone said, and you said, I need another million dollars. It sounds kind of crazy to give you that, right? But why are banks so confident about lending dentists with massive debt, $600,000, another $1.2 million? It is, it is so difficult to fathom that scenario. And I quick, quickly got to say here, Paul, you mentioned mom. Shout out to mom. Happy birthday, mama. Oh, I like I that. Love Thanks for supporting me throughout the years here in dentistry as well. She, she was a part of this dental household. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So getting back to the banks, Paul. Yeah, I guess it's sort of an incredible run that dentistry has had for the practice owner and everybody that works for the practice owners, frankly. It's a very stable environment, very productive environment, and therefore very profitable, too. And that's why we see the, the private equity all, all around our industry today. Uh, grabbing up the not only the dental practices, but they're grabbing up the labs, right? And they're grabbing up yeah. the distributors and they're grabbing up the manufacturers and and banks have have seen this and lived it. They've been lending in this space for a long time. And it's just such a stable environment, such such a successful environment for the practice owner with defaults of traditionally less than one percent on their loans. Banks will eat that up all day. And that's that's why we see them stepping up to provide those 100% to practice value loans. As long as we've got good credit as a provider that's stepping in to buy the practice, as long as we've got 7 to 10% potentially of what that loan will be in savings in our bank accounts, and, and that the cash flow is there to support that soon-to-be new practice owner post-sale and into their years beyond. Those banks will be be in there hundred percent, and that's why you know you're delivering so much great education. I want to add to it, and that's one of the values of working with a, a trusted transitions expert like yourself and the teams that you build with attorneys and accountants and banks is because while we I'll use C words while we should while we should celebrate that banks are going to give a million dollars to someone with five hundred thousand dollars in debt, we should be cautious. Because the bank doesn't care how much money you make. They just care that you pay your loan. So I have seen experiences where practice owners have become demoralized that they haven't made the money they thought they would make. They are servicing their loan. They are doing this. But it's key to make sure they're picking the right practice for them. Because just because a bank will loan the money doesn't mean it's going to be the practice that best fits your transitions goals. Is that a good way to put it, Rex? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And it kind of goes back to our valuation thoughts too, Paul, whereby with that third-party valuation, we've got a proration for the next 10 years of ownership with that practice based upon our sale price and the debt service put in there for that new owner, the buyer, and to show them what their ca cash flow would be after the sale is complete and they're in the operation of that practice. So they get to see exactly where their numbers can lie and hopefully build up some confidence in moving forward, not just because their bank will give them the loan, but because they can still run that practice, pay off all their debts and have some, some savings left over. Awesome. I think that's a really important point. Now let's talk about practice mm -hmm. owners. And, you know, I'm a practice owner and I'm 46, right? And there's 28 year old practice owners and 62 year old practice owners. And one of my you know lines, and maybe other people say it, is the day you should start 
learning how to sell your practice is the day you you buy it because life happens when you're making other treatment plans. But let's just talk about, you know, practice owners. When, how should they start preparing for a future sale and when should they start preparing? Yeah, you know, oftentimes people are coming to us and maybe they, they don't have a lot of time on their side. And that could be because of health concerns, movement in the family with jobs and opportunities in other places. Um, maybe it's, yeah, health concern. I said, not what, what not. So maybe they want to come to market in the next three to six months and be out in a year, year and a half. You know, in those scenarios, we're not going to forecast or, or really uh, cons consult them to put a lot of dollars into capital expenditures in the practice. It's more a time to just kind of tidy up the house a little bit. Yeah remove the clutter, maybe do what you can to streamline some processes and, and you know, maybe get some new flooring and decorate the walls a little bit better than yeah. you have. And just, you know, see yourselves as, as where the patient would be in your practice and, and take a look around and tidy it up where you can. You can't pump a lot of dollars in at that point. And uh, certainly you want to get your finances in order, no matter where you're at in preparing for your exit. And that's all about cleaning up some of the expenses going through the practice, making sure that you have a good fit between what you're producing, what you're collecting, and what people are paying. So make sure your collections are strong. Make sure you clean up some of your credit reports and whatnot if the day is coming and you're ready to go to market. If you've got more time, now it's awesome to bring in some of my partners across the country, our DDS match guys, including myself. And and come in and talk about where maybe the weaknesses might lie in the foundation of their practice and where they could get some growth moving forward to maximize the value. So it might be about negotiating with the PPOs out there. I, mean, I want to I want to interject there because that was echoed by on a previous podcast. One of the most important things you can do at any time in your career is to hire someone to see if you get paid more by dental insurance for doing the same work, because this means, I mean, I'll share with you, X, I don't know if you're going to go to Dennis Fantasy Camp one day and do a filling. I'm going to guess not. But we are handcrafting We are handcrafting the work in people's mouths, right? I mean, we are. It is, it is a lot of work, sweating on the outside, crying on the inside. So if you can be paid more for the same work, not only does this help you tomorrow, it also makes your practice more attractive for a sale. So that's an example, negotiating insurance fees. What's another example someone could do as they prepare for a future sale to improve the value. Yeah, they should take a look at their lease, you know, and, and see where they sit with their lease. And they certainly don't want to be left with no time on that lease and they, and they haven't brought the practice to market yet. You certainly don't want to sign up for a, a 10 year time frame now with your landlord either, where you can't get out and, and transition that, that lease over to a buyer. So you got to take a look at that lease. That's a strong piece as well. So we've got the lease. We're talking about negotiating fees. You want to streamline expenses wherever you can. You certainly want to fill in all the positions on your team as best you can with the highest quality people. That's very valuable today. Uh, you got to make sure your equipment's in good working order. Yeah. And if you're three to if you're three to five years out, you've got time now to look at some technologies out there that you could benefit from that would be really attractive to buyers as well. You know, I mean, well, I'll just add as a dentist, you know, we yeah. started utilizing, I'll make it, you know, brand diagnostic, one of the services that, uh, you know, does AI to help you read x-rays. And it's been great. You know, I mean, it's been fun. We've helped my associates. I wish I had it sooner. Right. So I think uh, you're making a really good point. If you're three to five years out and there are things that are not a, a huge expense and also wind up like making you money along the way, you may as yeah. well, it makes your practice more attractive. But, you know, one thing I want to share is I one time said to a dentist, he sent me a DM on Facebook, Rex, and he said, Paul, you were right. You were totally right. I said, tell me more about this. Most of my DMs are telling me how wrong I am, right? And he said, I did it. I said, what did you do? He goes, I gave my associate a contract that I would be happy to sign myself if I was the associate. And he goes, he signed it. And I go, yeah, because the energy was right. So I say to some of these sellers, and you might, you know, you can add, it was like, Make sure your practice looks like a practice that you would want to buy if you were 31 years old. Because I think too often, you know, if operatory five, you have to kick the delivery unit three times to get it started. Nobody wants to buy that when they started it. You might have been doing that for 20 years. So have you seen kind of similar things in helping dentists make their practice look, feel, and act that way to buyers? Yeah. Yeah. You know, definitely try to 
if you can, if you can fathom this doctor, you know, try yeah. to be chart chartless. That would be wonderful. You know, that's something that these young folks just don't experience is writing in charts anymore, you know, whether they're two years out or even maybe 10 years out, they've maybe never written in a chart. You know, we got to consider that like you're, like you're talking about Paul. And then at the same time though, I got to take, I got to take the seller's stance of, okay, well, this business has been working pretty good for me. And yeah, I did, you know, maybe just upgrade. It, it's been like 15 years for my chairs, units and lights, but they're still really working well. And I've got to sort of coach the buyers. Like if you were in their shoes, I don't know if you'd be pumping six figures. Oh, uh, you're, practice, you're a hunter, right? right? You know, I, I bought a practice in 2011 from, I always want to share, don't work with a dual rep broker. I work with a dual rep broker and that was, became a problem for me. You guys are just sell side brokers. And that's what I did when I was a broker. But I will share with you, they had the dental school chair, Rex, the ADEC that I had in dental school back in 2002. And the equipment person who was very nice, he goes, I don't think this chair is going to last much longer. And uh, it's 2024. And I was there yesterday. Chair's still there, right? So, still there. So, so I totally agree with you for buyers. Their expectations have to be managed between must-haves and nice-to-haves, you know, must-haves and, and nice-to-haves. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's just so many places to look when you're thinking about you know, preparing for that sale, but, but make sure your expenses are all in line, you know, non-traditional expenses should be thought about and, and just be able to bring about the evidence behind all those expenses. Cause we're going to pull those out yeah. and explain it to the buyers and whatnot, you know, but certainly don't make any big changes. And you talked about, you know, cutting down a day, Paul, that's one that just kind of gets under my craw a little bit. Cause that average practitioner that's been going for 35 years and they're doing 800,000 in four days. And then they, they want to cut down a day a few years before, before they get out. Well, now they're talking about cutting 25% of their revenues and, and freeing up just really eight to 10 hours in their week. And at the same time, they're going to, they're, they're going to lose from that maybe $70,000 in income per year by cutting out that day. And then they're going to cut 25% from the sale of their practice. I think so, you're hundred percent right. They have to see what kind of those, how those decisions impact their future decisions. And if it's worth it or not, I also share as someone who's run a dental practice for a long time, once you cut a day from these people, it is nearly impossible to get this day back. And that is your team, right? So if you take yeah. Fridays, if you work five days a week, dentist, and you take Fridays off, just know you have now taken Fridays off with the team you have for the rest of your career. You may be able to get a different team to come in a day a week, but I'm just sharing your point is so great. So as we wrap mm -hmm. up, Rex, remind our audience, if they're listening, which area do you cover? Where do you help Dennis with buying and selling? Yeah, so I'm I'm Rex, I'm in Chicago land, Northern Illinois with DDS Match. And yeah, thank you so much, Paul. This, is, this has been great. Yeah, you really shared so much. I loved hearing your story about your family history in the dental world. My dad was a dentist. I worked with him for 11 years before sadly he passed away, but it was the greatest time that I had. I work with my brother now and all the people, I call him like Mr. Rogers, the people in your dental neighborhood from equipment reps to brokers are really there to help you succeed. Just make sure you pick the right ones to put on your team. Rex, thank you so much for sharing with us today. People can text by to 215-543-6454 to connect with Rex and you can text sell to 215-543-6454. Thanks so much, Rex. Thank you, Dr. Goodman. Awesome, guys. Come on and see Rex, whoever's still here. Great job, Rex. Joe, great, great, great job. You guys were both awesome. That was great. So, so I have a question since, you know, was that experience, Joe, easier than you thought? Same as you thought? Harder than you thought? About what you thought it was going to be like? That's about what I expected. Okay, good. How about you, Rex? Yeah, yeah, I'd say the same. You know, I've, I've done a couple podcasts. I'm now never 100% comfortable, but then when you get going, it just kind of rolls, man. Yeah. So to get the biceps of Joe McGonigal, you probably have some high-level bicep exercises that you do. So if you guys want some high-level last-minute advice for getting new clients and being seen as a trusted resource, there's only this few minutes after our podcast. I go into the notes in your phone and put down five things, right? Like DSOs, DSOs are becoming more interested in practices that do more than 1.5 million, Joe. Rex, if you're going to sell in the next five years, you still have time to make improvements like negotiating insurance. Make like five educational points. That's what you post on Facebook. 
It's in your head. Yeah. I just made you say them all. Yeah. You can take a still shot. You could just post them in a comment. And just to remind you guys, to reinforce, because Lindsay works with sponsors every day, and they've been sponsors for five years, but sometimes they act like it's their first day in the group. Correct, Lindsay? Mm -hmm. If you're selling your services or educating in your department, you can put that you are a proud sponsor of the group. What this does is it agrees with the FTC regulations, because you guys are paying me. And two, it is a badge of honor to be a sponsor, okay? But if you say, Joe... I can't wait to go down to the shore in the summer because I freaking get a break, whatever. You don't have to say you're a sponsor because we got to tell him poor Matt Popper. He's putting that every time. And sometimes it just looks weird if you say, I like ice cream and I'm a sponsor. It's confusing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I just want to share and reinforce Muhammad, Ramil, Greg, Lindsay, Brandon, the difference. There's no penalty for not for putting that if you like going to Elvez in Philadelphia it just looks weird if you say you're a sponsor on a non-sponsored comment right <laughs> does that make sense it, I'd rather yeah. but I like Matt because people call Lindsay problems right someone goes if you want the greatest account in the world blah 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 you can use me and, and they never say they're a sponsor we got to go behind the scenes and say you can't really do that you got to or, or delete their posts so I'd rather more people be like Matt than not. But that's my mission to you. Take three or four things in this podcast. A did you know thing? A did you know? Watch out. Those are great things. Did you know that you can get paid more? For, I'm just telling you to. You're too. Chappelle is a great joke about standing too close to the elephant. You only see the backside of the elephant. If dentistry is the elephant, you're like standing next to it all the time. Most dentists have no idea you can negotiate your insurance fees. If I did a poll, saying, do you know that you could get paid by more by insurance by negotiating? You would be shocked by how many would say, I never knew that existed. If you That's said, oh, oh, I didn't know I could do that, right? Yeah. That's I mean, something like yeah. if you said most of my, I mean, most of my clients, when they transition to a DSO, sell 51 to 70% of their practice. So what that means is they're still invested in the success of that DSO and they're still in their practice. They have no idea. They think you just sell to a DSO, you throw them the keys and ride it off into the sunset. So those things are great. So I hope I've inspired you to get to the dental nachos gym. Like the five, there's only 55,000 people that would like to learn from you and become your clients from, from your phone. Okay. So we just got to fit that in to your day. Awesome guys. You guys are great. We'll get all this to you, Joe. We're going to, Lindsay's going to come on May 10th. And you said you got 25 people. I think so. So far, we just had more marketing go out today. I think Rob's sending another one. So hopefully it's closer to 40 by the time we get there. So we'll see. Um, all right, cool. Lindsay, nice. I stopped recording. I have someone I want. I know who wants to come or knows should come. So I'm going to see if I can get them there. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hope it goes well. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. the support. Everyone else.